Hello, and welcome back to the Calm and Connected podcast. I'm your host, Janine Halloran, and on today's episode, I get a chance to speak with Julie Lithcott Haynes. She is the New York Times bestselling author of books on human development, and she's also a TED speaker. You may have seen her TED talk, and she's a former Stanford dean. Today, we really focus on her newest book, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult. So she wrote a book all about how to help parents take a step back and against helicopter parenting. Um, but this one is really focused on the young people. So it's for those teenagers um, going up into young adulthood. And what does it mean to be an adult? What does being an adult really look like in this day and age? And what are the things that we can do as parents and as those who are raising young adults to help support them as they grow into adulthood and to fly on their own. So I really enjoyed our interview and I hope you do too. Thanks for listening. Julie, I am so excited to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Janine. Really excited to be with you and your listeners today. Thank you so much. So for people who might not know you, can you just give us a quick background and introduction? Um, yeah, I'm Julie Lifcott Hames. She, they, I'm 55, black and biracial. Um, I have been a lawyer. I have been a university dean at Stanford. I have, uh, my ro- most recent career is that of an author. I've written uh, three nonfiction books, one on the harm of helicopter parenting, one on uh, being black and biracial in white spaces, a very vulnerable memoir. And then my most recent book, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult, is me rooting for young adults to thrive, really drawn from my years as a Stanford dean. Um, And I'm a mom. I've got a 24-year-old and a 22-year-old. And I'm a daughter. My mother is in my life. Um, We all live together. And so I'm in that sandwich uh, generation that um, we will all get to if we're fortunate. I think in some ways it feels hard, but you know, to have your elderly parents alive and to have your children not yet launched and to be searching for the right way to serve and support them while not um, letting go of your own needs and desires and priorities. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot, but it's a good life. Yes, absolutely. It does. You are, you get into that sandwich generation. My parents are still with us and they don't live with us, but they're nearby. I'm raising teenagers. I've got a 13 and a 15 year old. So it's a, it's challenging. It is. is it not? I mean, it is just, yeah. it can be so overwhelming. And as the mom of teenagers, you know, one of the things that I think about is doing the things that I need to do in order for them to launch as properly as they possibly can. Right. So I was super excited actually to read your turn because I thought it was so good, not only in terms of my own parenting, but also the teenagers that I see as clients. So you wanted to write this book because you wanted to help out these kids and as they were growing into adulthood. So can talk a little bit more about your turn because I just, I love it so much. I'm so glad. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is my, I have to write on it. Mine, see how it says mine. That's how I'm sure not to like give it away to somebody like, no, this is the one that I actually use. Um, (laughs) Yeah, Your Turn was such a labor of love. Um, I'm holding it because this is a book that came out in the pandemic and I wrote much of it in the pandemic and I haven't really had the opportunity to tour it around the country the way I had with my first two books. And so I really feel like this is my third baby, but you know, I'm still helping it launch in the world. So really grateful to you, Janine, for um, the opportunity to talk with you about it and your listeners. This is a book on living your best life. And I wrote it for those who are young adults, uh, 15 plus, who are really struggling with, you know, is there a right track? Am I on the right track? I tell them there is no right track, right? That's a fallacy. It's sort of a limitation. These sort of trenches we try to force kids down into like, go, go be a this, go do a that. Like, what if you're, what if they don't, if that doesn't call to their soul, you know, if it's not who they are, um, who wants to live that life? So this is me, you know, trying to beckon from 55 years out. Like I, you know, come forward toward your adult life. It's yours. It's yours to craft. You will make mistakes. That's normal. Find humans who like you just 
just as you are, be in community relationship, workplaces with them. You know, it's, it's, it's trying to give permission for each individual to figure themselves out and go be that person. And I'm deeply interested in each one of us making that pursuit. So many of us, particularly in communities that are privileged, feel that we're unworthy if we haven't become an investment banker or a software engineer, as if those are the only two, or a doctor, those are the only few valid pursuits in life. And this is me saying, no, life is a wide open landscape. Figure out who you are, what you're good at, what you want, what you love, and go be that person. I think this book is ultimately giving permission for the reader to go and grab the life they want and craft the life they want. And so while I wrote it for young people, older people, people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s have read it and have said, I know I'm not your target audience, but I got so much out of this. And I'm not surprised because whether you're you know, figuring yourself out for the first time in your late teens or figuring yourself out over and over again, as you age, the questions are still the same. You know, who am I? What am I good at? What do I love? Where can I be myself doing the work that calls to me? And uh, so that's that's this book. It's a guide for living your best life, whatever age you are. Oh, it's so, it's wonderful. And I remember reading it and I was, I kept reading it as I was actually waiting in pickup lines at middle school. Um, because that's, you know, that's a time where you can get a little chance to be by yourself and, and, and read. And so I ended up, you know, talking with my daughter, who's my 15 year old, a little bit more about it. And it was always so interesting, um, to have the conversation about what does it mean to be an adult? What does it mean to be actually functioning in society as a fully grown, fully fledged human? And I actually, um, I had the conversation with a couple of my clients about that. So they're, one's a college sophomore and one's um, in uh, high school, he's a freshman. And so he was like, they were both like, what does it mean to be an adult? And I'm like, great question, I have a book for you. <laughs> nice. Um, and so we really, that's why I have these pages bookmarked because I actually did it with them. Like we went through it and we talked about what does it mean to actually be an adult? Um, what does it look like? It's, and it's not what you think. And especially as, you know, those kids are coming from families where they are very privileged and they are, their parents are, have like high flying jobs, like kids with <laughs> kids whose parents are attorneys, kids whose parents are traveling the world. And so to be able to think, sit and think, well, what does it mean for me to be an adult? How do I function? What do I look at? So if you could speak a little bit more about what does it mean to be an adult? <laughs> yeah. I think the first thing I want to say is I love that you're sharing this book with your clients, with kids. I love that. Um, number two, there are these definitions of adulthood or adulting that are really outdated. So you know, when our parents were, not to say we're the same age, but like when the older generation was coming up, adulting was just finish school, get a job, um, leave home, marry and have kids. And you were considered, everyone did that seemingly, you know, those were the norms. And if you were not adhering to those norms, you were a real outsider. Um, and, you know, that's what adult life was. And now we have so much more freedom and flexibility and um, those those old markers don't super apply. But when grandparents today say to their grandkids, what's wrong with you? When I was your age, I had left home, finished school, married, you know, like, well, grandpa, things have changed, you know, so um, we really do ourselves a favor when we interrogate the term adulthood or adulting. I think it boils down to, you know, you are more or less in charge of yourself, your body, your belongings, your bills. I call it taking care of business, the B words, body, bills, belongings, right? Meaning no one else is responsible for those things. When you're five, your parents are bathing you. When you're 12, they're probably still paying the bills associated with you. Even as you move into 17 and 18, they're still running after you. You forgot this, your belongings, right? They're bringing your backpack. 
But at some point you realize, okay, it's on me. I I'm responsible for this being. And it's a little scary because well, I'm responsible, but it's also delicious because it means you're not somebody's sort of pet on the end of a leash. You know, that's what always comes to mind as the picture, like a dog on a leash. Adulting is going off leash. Like you get to decide, <laughs> you know, you get to decide and um, nobody else does. It doesn't mean you're alone. It doesn't mean you're, um, that you don't have help. It doesn't mean um, that it's all on you. Um, but to be an adult is to know it's largely on me and I can. And I think that's the piece that is so important to get across because modern parenting with our inclination to overhelp and overhandle and manage is paradoxically telling our kids, I don't think you can, so therefore I will. And so our desire to help can result in an undermining of their confidence because we're doing too much, therefore they're doing too little and their developing psyche gets the feeling, my parents don't believe I can do this. Thank goodness they're there to handle it for me. Well, that can then lead to anxiety. Like I'm not okay out in the world, right? So we're inadvertently setting them up to feel I can't be successful. And so this book is you know, emphatically saying like, yes, you can. And let me put in there stories of people who have struggled and how they figured stuff out because I want you to see in the struggle of others that struggle is normal and it's how we learn and grow and ultimately succeed. Yeah. And you know what was so interesting as you're talking, I think of so many different books who sort of attack the same idea of you are in charge of you and helping kids learn how to do that themselves. So I think of Ned Johnson's work and, yeah. you know, and uh, the self-driven child where yeah. it's really that anxiety when we over parent is clearly impacting our children in a negative way. I also think of Wendy Mogul's work, the blessings of a skinned knee. Absolutely. Um, you know, those, those are the things it's really hard. I understand this. And I always say this to my families that I work with. I understand as a parent, it's very hard to step back. It's very yeah. hard not to step in and fix and do, but it's, you know, it's like when they're at the playground, you can't stand under them while they are climbing the monkey bars and expect that they are going to be able to figure out how to do it. If we're always catching them. And so just like it was really hard to sit on the sidelines at, at, when you were at recess and when they're bringing into the playground, you sometimes have to sit back and, you know, be able to say, you know, I, how can I support you in this? Do you need me to help you problem solve or do you need me to just listen to you vent about this situation and, and help you in that way? You know, and I think it's, it's very tricky. It's so hard for parents, right? <laughs> like it's just so tricky to be able yeah. to let go. Yeah, particularly when we are um, self-confident, we're professionally accomplished, successful, educated, we are very enamored of our own abilities, right? So it's like, why wouldn't I give my children everything I possibly can? In other words, let me stand with my body under the monkey bars so that they never fall, right? I Why would I not, right? Why would I not rewrite their essay since I can, why would I not provide that help? And the missing piece is because they will never learn how to work their body. If you're always there to catch them from a fall, like, yes, please prevent them from dying. Please prevent them from walking into traffic. Please prevent them from drowning, you know, but monkey bars are put at a certain height on a, on a approved playground for children because the people who've studied this have decided, yeah, if they fall, it'll be an ouch, but they're not going to kill themselves, you know, and they have to learn. And so, you know, we, it's a, a good deal of parenting is like holding your breath and watching the learning happen. Yes. And I think that's the hardest part is like the, to, to watch the learning happen and not be able to step in. But it, and that's so funny because I think a lot of us, when like in my generation, the generation before, there was a lot more less 
hands-on, right? So it wasn't like people were right there with us. So it's almost like we tried to overcorrect and now here we are. And then we're trying to also then unlearn that and be able to help our kids in the way that is most beneficial to them in a way yeah. that's going to set them up so that they can do the things that they need to do. So I actually um, ended up talking to uh, the family of one of my clients um, because they were struggling as she went into college. So that's that's a really big shift when they are living in someplace else and, they're, and they can't really control or see or manage everything they're doing anymore, right? Yeah. So um, we talked a lot about, and I actually recommended all of your books because I was like, you need to read these because I think it's going to really help you understand that what she's doing is developmentally appropriate, number one, and yeah. the that she needs to actually grow and to be her own person. So she is managing things. Yes, you're still paying for a lot of stuff, but the goal is to get her to do that later on. But we have to give her some space in order to do that. Right. So what do you think parents should do? How should they best support their children as they're entering young adulthood? So it was my um compassion for college students that led me to write how to raise an adult on the harm of the encroachment style parenting helicopter parenting and my compassion for college students that made me write this book for them for all young adults your turn um because i could see i'm not a psychologist um but i could tell i could sense that the kind of excessive handholding into the college years was undermining their skills and their sense of confidence. And I really wanted to delve into what's going on psychologically, what's happening. And my hunches were borne out by the research coming out of the field of psychology. So I think to parents, I would say this, and I do say this, um, and let, let me, before I go any farther, I've said I have a 24-year-old and a 22-year-old. I have the expertise of a career, I'm an author, but I was doing the very problems I describe. I was, the very bad behaviors that I critique, I was doing. So I think that's become my sweet spot as an author and speaker on this issue. It's like, I'm not judging you. I've been there. I've been doing it. And I saw it, the harm of it in other people's kids as a dean I realize the harm of it in my own family. I'm trying to help people not fall into the traps I fell into. And so to parents, I say, look, you were once really, really good at this. When your kid was learning to walk, they were beginning to walk away, you know? And you knew if you held their hand as they were trying to walk or worse, if you went up behind them on your knees and put your fingers under their armpits and kind of let them fall against your body whenever they fell and you could hold them up with your fingers under their armpits and you could sort of fake walk them across the carpet to, you know, the other partner, the spouse, if you have one, like that's not teaching your kid to walk. That's teaching your kid that my body, my effort will always be here to prop you up and they would not learn to walk. So we know that as excruciating as it is to see them fall, we have to make sure the environment is clear of sharp objects and let them learn to walk, right? That was good parenting, right? Clap, instead of like, oh no, you felt like, yay, try again, right? Try again. The environment is safe. You can do this. We believe in you. We're excited, right? All of that is implicit in our faces and our tone of voice with our one-year-olds. The trouble is we forget that that same approach is necessary for everything they have to learn. Learn to use the stove. Learn to cross the street, okay? Learn to take public transportation, right? All of this, learn to have that scary but necessary conversation with your teacher about how you're doing like all of the things they've got to practice right they've got to be the one to do it and um then when we've done it every step of the way the shift to college isn't this massive change so ideally we're not waiting until they're leaving for college to say oh hey maybe you should start being responsible for your own deadlines belongings 
transportation, food, right? We're supposed to prepare every step of the way. In every 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 few months, we should be asking what what are the skills they almost have have like we need to make sure that we're stepping back so that next time they're the one to do it right for example i realized when my son was 12 and he was about to head off on a on a uh, one of these excursion learning trips to a different country i realized he'd never gone through an airport by himself or yeah. not you know and that's not unusual for a, for a kid of 12 um, um but i didn't want him to feel bewildered when he was going to, you know, be with this group of people. So I said, you know what, let's take, we're taking a trip before your big trip. I want you to be the one to lead the family through the airport. You read the signs, you decide where the security gate is. You decide where our actual gate is, you know, we'll follow you. And, and he made some mistakes and it was, we left enough time so that he could make mistakes and send us in the wrong direction. And, you know, it was a little, my heart was beating a little bit like, oh my gosh, he doesn't know where to go. Of course he doesn't know where to go. He's never done this before. So opportunities to practice every step along the way makes that transition to college easier. Yeah. Oh, I think it's lovely to think about building that in so that it isn't so shocking when it ends up happening, because I there is that piece of you know, I, there's a couple of people I follow on Instagram and they, what they do is they have all their kids, like they, they put all their posts, um, that kids, text messages that their kids have sent, like, what's my social security number? Like, how do I boil pasta? Like all these things that they didn't know beforehand. Um, and it, it's like done in sort of like a joking manner, but it makes me think like, okay, so what can I do to layer in so they know how to buy their clothes? They know what shoe sh size they are. That You know what I mean? Like all these different things, like, can you boil an egg? Can you make ramen so you can survive college? You know, those are the things. If, if, if college is the way that you're going to go right. too, and to be able to let that, to uh, sit back and try not to control what they do, where they are and what they're going to do with their life is very hard. <laughs> yeah. You know, let me add that. I think part of what's hard is um, in our modern parenting culture here in the United States, at least we've sort of, we feel like we earn a merit badge whenever as a parent, whenever we do something for our kids, instead of for teaching our kids to do something and that's an important pivot that we all need to make. Like you're not a great parent because you handled that for your kid. You're a great parent when you teach your kid how to handle it for themselves. And teaching often entails stepping back, you know, offering moral support and saying, I'm confident you can figure this out. And it's tricky to do that. And it's hard to do that. But I think that shift again, say those words again, where we're, we have to do what? <laughs> well, we think we're great parents when we've handled something for our kid, but we're actually great parents when we've taught them how to handle it themselves. Perfect. I love that. And I think that is what we need to be thinking about. How can we allow them to handle it themselves? And how can we support them in a way that's going to be beneficial? And, you know, I just, there are so many great things in the book that I, I absolutely love. Like there was one part of it where you talk about the research of just having small interactions with strangers during the day is actually so powerful. And mm -hmm. I've noticed myself enjoying those moments even more. I'm like, oh, this is what Julie talked about in her book. <laughs> I, love I love it. And Janine, the reason I put that point in the book, there's a whole chapter called Start Talking to Strangers humans are key to your survival. Why did that deserve an entire chapter? Because for a couple generations now, we've taught kids don't talk to strangers out of a fear of, you know, that very, very highly unlikely chance of a stranger being cruel to you. We have created this overbroad rule, don't talk to strangers. The actual skill is learn how to discern in your environment, which stranger is that one bad one versus the 99.9% .9 of humans who are fine. Okay. We're supposed to teach them how to develop the instincts about, is this person okay to talk to? Should I avoid this one? And we should be modeling for them that humans interact with each other all the time. 
the research, as you've pointed out, shows when we make a kind gesture to a stranger, we look them in the eye, we smile, we say, how's your day going? We say, thank you so much for which, whatever you're delivering me this, serving me that, you know, being here at the grocery store to pay for, you know, to ring up my groceries. It creates a kindness interaction that is good for that person. It's good for us. And anyone who watched it happen feels like, okay, the world is a kind place because I'm watching people be kind. So it becomes this magical thing, like the interactions we can have, which don't cost us a dime. You know, it doesn't cost you anything to say to a stranger, you know, a comp pay a compliment to a stranger. Like that is a gorgeous dress. That is a wonderful hat. I just want you to know those shoes. I love them, right? It lights people up. They feel they matter to be noticed, you know? So we need so much more of that and and so much less of the don't talk to strangers. Like little kids today, if you say hi to them, they think something's wrong with you. <laughs> you know, like, oh, that person said hi to me. You know, I'm trying to bring saying hi to strangers back. Well, and just having those tiny interactions when you're waiting in line at the post office, when you're waiting in line in Target, if you're, you know, hanging out at Starbucks, it doesn't have to be big. It's something that can be really small. But I like the idea of the ripple effect where it impacts not only you and the person you're interacting with, but it also impacts those around you. So you see that kindness. Like I even think about something as simple as letting people in for traffic. Um, and so we were coming back home from Cape Cod, as you know, it's a little bit trafficy on yeah. Labor Day weekend. And, you know, oh. we're all trying to get into yeah. line. And one car, a few cars ahead of us stopped and let a car in. And then the next car let a car in. And the next car let a car in. So suddenly everything is moving. Now we're all still moving at a snail's pace. But yeah. Now people are able to act, those poor people who are in this line of cars that's down the road and around the corner are finally also able to move in. So something is just something as little as that in a weekend where it's really hard to sit in traffic, that makes a big, huge difference. So I yeah. love seeing that impact. And then somebody, we did it too. And then somebody behind us didn't, but I kept watching and then more people started doing it again. So I was like, it's okay. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> humans, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have our individual needs, like I need to get home, but you know, we have to be cooperative too. Cause if we're not cooperative, we just fall into anarchy. And so it's called the zipper effect of these cars blending together. Like you just described. And in some communities it's natural and in others, they're like, Nope, it's all about me. If I can zip to the front, that's what I'm going to do and to hell with everybody else. And so yes, teaching that we are inherently cooperative, that we make room for others, that we can have confidence that others will also make room for us, um, that that's part of the beautiful human dance that we do. Um, you know, that's that's an important thing to be telling our kids and, and in the car to say out loud, I'm gonna make room for this driver, you know, cause that's the right thing to do. And the person behind me should do the same. Up, oh, they didn't. Oh, but the person behind them did. Yay, humans. Like to hear, our kids need to hear us making these observations about interaction. You know, my son, who's 24, came home to us for the pandemic um, when he was 20. And, uh, you know, he spent a lot, it was, we call it bonus years, thanks to the pandemic. We've had this kid in our life longer than we probably would have. And so he would see his dad and I kind of working out some conflicts, you know, like we had a conflict with an, another adult and we were talking through how to approach this person, what to say, what not to say. And he said, thanks for having this conversation in front of me. It's reassuring to me to see that you are still figuring it out. And that's to your earlier question, what is adulting? That's another piece of it. Adults don't have it all figured out. We have confidence we can, with effort, figure something out, right? So we were show, and we realized only when he said, thanks for having that conversation in front of me, did we realize we had probably shielded him and his sister from these conversations about how are we going to work this out? How are we going to, you know, we thought we were protecting them by taking all the tough conversations away. But as Poe Bronson writes about in Nurture Shock, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we're sort of smoothing our kids' experience. If they don't see us 
you know, figuring something out, having a concern, having a tough conversation, they don't learn how adults do it. We should certainly shield them from big fights, but most of our interactions as spouses and partners, I hope are not big fights. It's more like, okay, can we talk this through? I have a concern, you know, um, they need to, they need to see this sort of relational stuff modeled. And I think that is one of the hugest things that I have noticed, even in my work with teaching coping skills is the not the being able to model, to say it out loud, to narrate it for your children, um, is incredibly powerful because you can tell them all the things that you want. You can tell them how to solve a problem. You can tell them how to work through a conflict. You can tell them how to take deep breaths when they're having frustration or whatever, but until they see you actually doing it and make that connection because you've narrated, narrated it for them, or they've been able to really see it modeled in front of them, it doesn't really sink in the same way. You can say it all you want, but you really have to model it. And this that's hard work for us as the adults to do, but I think it is valuable for our kids to be able to see that. Um, so is there one big takeaway that you want people to get from your turn that you'd like to share? It's a big book. I know. <laughs> it's hard to pick one, but I guess I will say... Um... There is no right track. I said this at the outset, but that's because it's one of my favorite concepts. There is only the next step that feels right to you right now. There is no objective right path that you are failing to be on. I think so many young kids today feel it's law, business, medicine, engineering, you know, or I can be a tennis star. Like you've got five options and it's just so sad. Um, but I live in Palo Alto, the heart of Silicon Valley. And too many of our kids feel like losers if they're not, you know, excelling up the wazoo in math and science. And some kids will excel up the wazoo in math and science. But the world needs poets and the world needs theater artists and the world needs wilderness naturalists and EMTs who ride in ambulances and third grade teachers. And none of these roles are less than being an engineer. The world needs engineers, but the world doesn't only need engineers, right? So I really I really hope that this book, which is deeply inclusive in terms of the stories that are told, people from across various spectrums of humanity around race and gender and sexual orientation and religion or lack of religion and parentage, ancestry, immigrant status, um, you know, degree of education. It's just, you know, trying to say every individual counts who you are as an individual, making the most of the person you know yourself to be, even if society's like, wow, well, you know, like I am rooting, I am rooting for every reader to see themselves somewhere in these pages, to feel permission to go toward what their inner voice is telling them. Chapter five is stop pleasing others. They have no idea who you are. And I think that's the central offering. They have no idea who you are. You got to figure out who you are. And then you got to find the courage to go be that person. I, that is one of the things that I absolutely loved about the book is that there is no right track. There is no perfect way to do something. And you're fooling yourself into believing that there is one and that you're not on it. <laughs> you know, that like there is no, like you don't have to do this by this age and this by this age and this by this age. What sparks you? What brings you joy? What makes you happy? What, what's something that you're really interested in that you feel like you could do for the rest of your life or maybe just a period of time in your life? you know, and be okay with, it's not, you're not going to potentially have the same job for your whole entire life and be satisfied with that and get a watch at the end and then retire. Like that doesn't happen. <laughs> it's not like, satisfying. It's no, not satisfying. If you do that, you end up feeling like you are a robot in your exactly, human existence. Exactly. And that's not what we want for our kids. And that's not mm -hmm. what I want for them to be able to do. I want them to figure out who they are 
and do that and not be ashamed and not be and be brave just go out and be brave in the world and i think that's pretty amazing if they can do that and be able to stand up and say i want to go into theater <laughs> and do it <laughs> because yep, we exactly. all need that we need theater <laughs> we need we, we need musicians we need artists right, right. we need that yep. and yeah. more kids should stand up and do that so i'm i'm hopeful and i'm grateful for you i want to make sure that i'm honoring your time and i always ask my guests one last question um what are your coping skills how do you like to rest and relax <laughs> um i have this funny thing i love the new york times crossword um it's for those who do crosswords you know monday is easy easiest you know saturday is the hardest sunday is its own special complexity um i actually when i'm stressed about life work whatever i need to just like do some crosswords um there's something about the mental stimulation that feels like play for me i also am doing duolingo to learn spanish finally i've taken spanish one like three times in my life and now i think i'm finally at spanish two thanks to duolingo and again it's work like a crossword puzzle is but it's fun work for my brain and it really sort of settles me um, so that's not the self-care that other people speak of, but those are two really tried and true go-tos for me. Like, let me just get myself regulated. Let me do a little Duolingo or a little New York Times. You know what? Crossword puzzles are great. I, I think it's a phenomenal uh, coping skill. I actually think it's a wonderful way to relax because it's a way that you can interact with your, like your brain is on, but not focused on the, on work. And sometimes for yeah people whose brains are busy it's helpful to have something else that really sucks you in versus something yeah. like just sitting and getting a massage where your brain will just wander onto oh, all the yeah. things that are going to that are stressing you out like it's it doesn't always work and that's fine and <laughs> everybody is different but yeah. and you are the second person I've talked to in the last week who's talked to me about Duolingo actually she was learning Spanish as well so I oh my I, god isn't that funny? It's a fabulous interface. It's fabulous. And it's tooled, you know, it, it responds to what you're doing well, what you're not doing well. So it is an entirely customized for you experience, which is, and the user interface is excellent. So it's really quite a pleasure. Yeah. I, I started learning Korean myself. So I was like, I, it's been very fun, actually. Yeah. I find it, it's so silly, but just like you, I find it to be relaxing and I find it it helps me focus. It gives me something that I'm doing and it's pleasurable and it's interesting and fun, um, but it's not work and it's, I love it. So I, yeah. I'm so thankful that you <laughs> also are sharing that as well. Um, if people want to get your turn, where should they go? What would, where would yeah. you go? Thank you. They can go anywhere. Your turn is available in all formats. I, I narrated the audio book. Um, so there's a Kindle version, an audiobook version, um, hardback, softback at any bookstore, library. Um, you should be able to find it. So yeah, please check it out. Would love for you to get it. Give it to someone you love. Oh, thank you so much again for being on the podcast. I really, truly appreciate it. My pleasure, Janine. Thanks to you and everyone who listened to us. Yes. And as for all the listeners, thank you so much for listening. If you like this podcast, feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. And as always, take a few minutes, have a little fun and have an awesome day.